Hello, everyone, and welcome to Echo Asthma Boot Camp. My name is Ashley. I'm your facilitator. I am joined by my uh, wonderful coordinator, uh, Tabitha, as well as our fantastic hub team, uh, Dr. Meredith McCormick and Andrea Jensen, certified asthma educator. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, and we have a wonderful uh, group here. Um, hello, Michael. Um, Hello, Marsha. So nice to see all of you again. Uh, we'll probably be reaching out in the chat just to sort of get your credentials so that we um, can introduce you all to Andrea and Meredith. But at this time, I'd like to let them introduce themselves to you. Um, hi, Maureen. So nice to see you. Um, all righty. Um, Meredith, take it away. Hi, good afternoon. I'm excited to be here. My name is Meredith McCormick. I'm a pulmonologist at Johns Hopkins, and I specialize in asthma um and look forward to uh working with the group thank you hi everyone i'm andrea i work just south of salt lake city and i run an asthma home visit program i'm funded through the cdc i'm a certified asthma educator had asthma all my life and raised three adult kids with allergies and asthma so pretty much all i do professionally and personally <laughs> thank you so much andrea and hello to dr karitsky also one of our fabulous hub team members we are just taking our polling questions now. If you'd like to introduce yourself to the group, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood <laughs> and look forward to working with this group. We'll all probably get a lot smarter about management of asthma. So I'm glad you're all here. Thank you, Dr. Kuritsky. And now Dr. Kuritsky, would you like to introduce yourself to the group before we get started with our first module? Well, thank you. So my name is Louis Kurinsky. I'm a family medicine physician. I've been involved in academics for a long, long time. I started out at UCLA in 1973 and I was with University of Florida for 35 years and most recently affiliated with University of Central Florida. I live in Gainesville, Florida, which is the home of University of Florida, but the residency program I work in right now is actually affiliated with University of Central Florida. It started out as a little itty bitty school years ago, now the second largest university in the United States with over 60,000 students. Uh, I have an interest in asthma, but I certainly wouldn't call myself an asthma expert. What I want to be able to do is to provide the patients that whose care comes under my, my opportunity with the best advice that could be given by primary care. And I certainly would not say that this is a disease that could be managed solely by primary care in many situations. There are oftentimes patients where despite our best efforts, we definitely need the assistance of our pulmonology colleagues to carry the flag a little further in the battle to maintain asthma control. So while I wish I could answer the most deep and, and the complex questions about complicated asthma, many of these situations are beyond me. And then lastly, I probably need to inform you of the setting in which our residency program is. We're in what's called a FQHC, Federally Qualified Health Center. And what that means is that a majority of our patients are lesser socioeconomically and educationally privileged. So often we don't have the opportunity to provide the solutions to their problems that would be accessible to more affluent individuals. So we always have to be cognizant of the limitations of what we can provide some of which are simply economically and other access issues. So I hope that will describe for you who I am and how I help to help share a number of hours with you over the next few weeks. Thank you so much, Dr. Kuritsky. All righty, well, without further ado, we will start our first uh, lecture on defining severe asthma. This is uh, hosted by Dr. Sucharita Kerr. Good day, everybody, and welcome to the Echo Asthma Bootcamp, Intensive Training for Severe Asthma Care. My name is Dr. Sucharita Kerr. I'm an assistant professor at Tufts University School of Medicine and a pulmonologist in the Division of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine at Tufts Medical Center in Boston. The learning objectives for this program include describe how GINA guidelines impact the current standard of care, Identify criteria for severe asthma and asthma phenotypes to avoid diagnostic delay. Assess severe asthma treatment options and identify which patient would benefit based on their phenotype and endotype. 
evaluate shared decision making and incorporate into your practice. So in today's session, we'll talk about defining severe asthma. So what is the definition of severe asthma? The American Thoracic Society and the European Respiratory Society have defined severe asthma as one that requires treatment with guideline suggested medications for GINA steps four and five, which usually include high dose inhaled corticosteroids, as well as a second controller regimen and or systemic steroids for more than 50% of the previous year to either prevent it from becoming uncontrolled or that remains uncontrolled despite this therapy. It accounts for about five to 10% of patients with asthma and it nearly contributes to 50% of the healthcare costs for asthma, which is often into the billions. So when is asthma considered uncontrolled? It's defined mainly by symptoms. So anybody with frequent daytime or nighttime poor symptom control, patients who have frequent exacerbations, particularly severe exacerbations that require two or more bursts of steroids in the prior year, each burst being more than three days each. History of serious exacerbations, such as those that require hospitalization or intensive care unit stay or mechanical ventilation in the prior year, and evidence of expiratory airflow limitation on spirometry. So these are patients who have pre-bronchodilator FEV1 below 80% predicted and a ratio of FEV1 to FEC below the lower limits of normal. But I'd like to bring to your attention that not all uncontrolled asthma is severe. In fact, severe asthma is just a subset of asthma that is overall uncontrolled. And I'd like to try to differentiate between what severe asthma is and differentiating it from difficult to manage asthma. So when I approach asthma as a pulmonologist, I take this five-pronged approach. I often talk to the patients about what is it in their environment that triggers their asthma, such as smoking. This can be primary or secondhand smoking. It can be exposure to certain pets. It's quite common in the patient population I see. Exposure to mold or dust or seasonal exposure, such as pollen or ragweed, based on the season of the year. The next is to talk about adherence. And one of the first things I do is to look at the patient's inhaler technique. It's really important that they use their inhalers correctly, not only because they should be getting optimal medication dose, but also to really prevent side effects, particularly if their inhaler technique is not correct. Thereafter, really inquiring about some of the other barriers to non-adherence, and many of them are non-intentional. Some of these inhalers are quite expensive, and talking about whether cost is an important consideration for the patient to be able to use their inhaler is extremely important. What are their beliefs about inhaler use in asthma? And finally, the lack of knowledge or health literacy. A lot of patients don't necessarily understand the difference between a controller regimen and an as-needed or emergency use inhaler. And it's really important for us as healthcare providers to be able to educate our patients because ultimately that leads to improved adherence. It's important to assess psychosocial problems such as anxiety, depression, or social isolation. A lot of these are predictors of poor asthma outcomes as well as emergency room visits. And then assessing for comorbidities, gastroesophageal reflux disease that can worsen asthma, recurrent rhinosinusitis, or aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease, all of which are different manifestations of asthma, but certainly can ultimately lead to difficult to manage or difficult to control asthma. Obesity has been associated with more severe asthma, difficult to control asthma, and then really looking for vocal cord dysfunction or paradoxical vocal fold motion disorder, where when a patient attempts to inhale, the vocal cords adduct, leading to difficulty breathing. And it's particularly important to assess because it can actually coexist in about a third or 37% of patients who also have asthma. And so it's important to differentiate between the two and then incorrect or coexisting diagnoses. After you've looked at the first four columns here, it's really important, and especially if the patient's not doing better, it's important to ensure that we diagnose the patient appropriately. Or do they have another coexisting diagnosis? Eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis um, is a syndrome of vasculitis where asthma is actually a part of it. And so if the patient has difficulty control of severe asthma, it's important to evaluate to see if they may have the syndrome Similarly, if they have exposure to mold or a hypersensitivity to mold, do they have allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis? 
and a lot of my asthmatics have smoked or have, or have had significant secondhand smoke exposure, putting them at risk for COPD or the so-called asthma COPD overlap syndrome, which needs to be managed somewhat differently than just regular asthma. And then once all of this is done, it's really important that we do our part and really follow the guidelines to ensure that we are appropriately managing these patients according to what the guidelines recommend. You may have seen this slide before. This is from the Global Initiative for Asthma, the 2020 update, and it represents asthma management for adults and adolescents over the age of 12. And most patients with asthma can get treated with step between step two and step four treatment. And it's not until we really reach step four and step five when we should really consider the possibility of severe asthma. This is when these patients require a combination of medium to high dose inhaled corticosteroids and a long acting bronchodilator, perhaps even a leukotriene antagonist and a theotropium mist. And this is when really we should start thinking about what else can we provide for our patients to get better control on their asthma. And so to reiterate, it's not until we've really ruled out all the reversible causes of asthma or potential triggers and eliminated them do we attribute somebody as having severe asthma. And so it's really important to differentiate between these two. Now, why is it important to do? Because really standard treatments may not be adequate in patients with severe asthma. And it really comes down to the fact that severe asthma is quite a heterogeneous disease. It's a disease with different symptoms and triggers. Patients respond differently to treatments, and they even have a different clinical course. Even within a patient's lifetime, there may be periods where patients are very well controlled on as-needed inhalers, such as albuterol, or perhaps one inhaler, one steroid inhaler. But they may go through a lifetime based on exposure to some of the symptoms that they actually may require two or three controller regimens to get their asthma adequately controlled. We don't quite understand the natural history uh, or the long-term history of severe asthma. Some have postulated the role of bacterial infection. Pseudomonas and Haemophilus influenzae have been identified and isolated in these patients' lungs, even though they don't have underlying other structural lung disease, such as bronchiectasis. Similarly, chlamydia infections have been associated with fixed airflow obstruction. A lot of this is hypothesis, and there's much work going on to understand severe asthma better. There's also variation in the presence and the type of airway inflammation. Some of these are eosinophilic. Some of these are predominantly neutrophilic inflammation. Some of them is a combination or mixed of both eosinophilic and neutrophilic. And some may predominantly be non-inflammatory, that they have no inflammation or predominantly structural disease in their airways. Patients with severe asthma tend to have thicker epithelium, increased smooth muscle mass, and they also tend to be less responsive to inhaled steroids, uh, oral steroids, as well as demonstrate more air trapping. Thank you for listening, and we'll open this up for some question and answers. All right. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank you, Dr. Kerr. Uh, so what we like to do at this stage is to ask our wonderful hub team what they feel our key takeaways are for this lecture. So we covered a lot of ground. This is a great introductory lecture and thinking about how we define severe asthma uh, and the cardinal features um, clinically, as well as what we would see if we were able to look directly into our patient's airways that smooth muscle hypertrophy and um, the increased phlegm that we often see clinically with patients that are coughing or wheezing and don't have good control. And as we think about the new um, guidelines and the steps as we're evaluating patients um, and thinking about the medication that is needed to achieve control, which is part of, of how we define asthma severity. Um, and so keeping in, in mind the uh, new GINA guidelines, I think, is, is very helpful. One thing I really like about the presentation we just heard is first the description that severe asthma is not one entity. I think for many of our colleagues who may be involved in primary care settings, we recognize even though there's a very clear designation of what constitutes resistant hypertension, it's not one disease. Sometimes it's from sleep apnea. 
Sometimes it's from obesity. Sometimes it's from non-compliance. Sometimes it's from hyperaldosteronism. The idea that severe, severe asthma is categorically defined is very useful though, because I think for the first time with this guideline, it leads clinicians to start thinking ahead of time. What is the next step going to be? Because we've previously been guided by saying, here's what you should do for your first step of medicine and for your second step of medicine and your third step. But I didn't recall seeing a warning light before that when I start to step into box four, I start to think, does this person's physiology, whatever part is deranged, is it going to require a different type of intervention like with a biologic to look at what's really going on with their asthma that I've been treating for the most part, mostly mechanically with bronchodilators and nonspecific anti-inflammatory agents. So I, I like the new guidance that's given to us by, by Gina, and I think it offers us a way to restructure our thinking about how asthma should be addressed, whether you be a pulmonologist or a primary care clinician. Yes, and I really like a lot of the comments that Dr. Kerr had in there because as we know, there's no one size fits all when it comes to asthma and we know that there are different types of asthma. So really trying to figure out, okay, that's a really small percentage of, it's a small percentage to start out with of people that have asthma and an even smaller percentage of that, that five to 10% that really have that severe asthma. So is it the right diagnosis? What else is going on? And, and oftentimes when I'm able to, right now I'm doing virtual asthma visits. Um, I'm anxious to get back into the homes because oftentimes I see a lot of environmental problems. Um, and since I have asthma, oftentimes when I walk into a home, I end up having an asthma attack and I can um, smell either pet urine or there's smokers in there. I can smell mold and mildew. And so um, really looking at our, is it really severe asthma or do they need to make some changes to the environment because they can take as much medication as they want. But if they're not really in a safe environment where they're living or even working, uh, a lot of people have occupational asthma. So really looking at the environment and then uh, a lot of things, and we already touched on this, was adherence. So oftentimes people don't understand why they need to take asthma medication. And when I talk to them about their controller, I'll say, this isn't going to help you feel better automatically. It's not like using your rescue inhaler. Um, when you're using your daily controller, it's preventative. And so if you think of it like a high blood pressure medication or a high cholesterol medication, neither of those things you know you have until the doctor gives you your labs. So it's really preventative. And then uh, another tool I, I really like to use, and, and I've shared this before on another one, is to make it really simple for them. Try to hold that up to my camera. Um, this is a paper towel tube. And, and it's covered with the smooth muscles. And so we show them that this is what happens for, for you normal people that don't have asthma. And for those that do have asthma, I show them, I talk about the inflammation and that's that underlying thing. Nobody knows it, you can't see it, you can't feel it. Then I talk about how the smooth muscles um, contract and, and I lost the mucus I normally have in here. It's a little piece of uh, saran wrap, but um, I have the professional models, but it doesn't seem to click with them as much. And so when I show them these and I'll say, you know, whatever you do, if you remember nothing else from our visit today, remember you do not want to be a pool noodle and have to try to breathe through that. So it's really cutting out a lot of variables and really drilling down to, is it really severe asthma or is there something else going on? I'd like to make a plea for a little bit of reframing in addition to what my colleagues have shared. And that is when people come to see me, if they have high blood pressure or cholesterol problems, just as Andrea said, they don't know it. But when I tell them about that, they say, oh, cholesterol, that's serious. That could cause me a stroke or it could kill me. Oh, hypertension, that causes heart disease. That's serious, that could kill me. I really think that the public awareness about the gravity of asthma is much underplayed. Asthma may be categorized as a nuisance disorder or an inconvenience, despite the fact that for the last two decades, between four and 6,000 people a year have died from asthma. So I, I think we need to give asthma the recognition it deserves and put it right up there on a pedestal with other potentially mortal disorders. Not, not that it's an innocent, readily fixable thing, but it's an important thing that merits your attention the same way hypertension and hyperlipidemia do. Just to follow up on that, my family, my kids and I have started to point out when we see on television or particularly in movies, Hollywood asthma, 
once you start looking for it, it's very common in movies that, you know, someone who, uh, a character who um, is nervous or anxious, they give them an inhaler and then they sort of throw it away. And when everything's better, they don't need their inhaler anymore. And that, that idea of Hollywood asthma is just something to keep an eye out for. And I think really um, represents the concept you were describing, how the, um, we, we're messaging to the, to the public that this is not a serious condition when, when in fact it is. Right, and I include that as part of my asthma home visit program. I let them know that every day in America, by the time all of us go to bed tonight, another 10 people will have died from asthma. Same thing tomorrow night and the next night. And so I tell people I don't want to scare them, I, but I do want them to know it can be deadly. And uh, I had a son that was in the hospital eight times in an ICU twice. He almost died. Um, he did. He was one of those small percentage that has that severe asthma. So it does happen. So uh, once again, we tell them we don't want to scare them, but it, it is a possibility. And, and let's stop that from happening and do everything we can to help them. Thank you all so much. Do we have any questions from the group about our first lecture or anything that our hub team has mentioned so far? Feel free to just raise your hand, turn on your camera, uh, write it into the chat. Well, then I'd like to ask our hub team, do, do you have any questions that you'd like to pose to the group? Yes, I'd, I'd like to know something from our colleagues about whether their patients are anxious about the steroids that they take. Mm -hmm. Because I, I think my vigilance for patient hesitancy in a variety of areas has grown so dramatically magnified because of COVID hesitancy. And then I, I was very shocked when adults all over the country questioned whether their children should be getting HPV vaccine. And when I was a, a young man in medicine, the patients were generally willing to do whatever best medical advice was without a moment's hesitancy. I, I also have to say that I feel like we haven't completely worked out the story of steroid toxicity yet, because for a number of years, we have begged off and said, well, don't worry about the steroid because the fracture rate doesn't appear to be meaningfully increased. Well, that may be, but that's also because most of the people who are being treated for asthma are younger than the fracture risk period, which is maximum. There is no argument that high dose steroid can reduce bone mineral density, and that's certainly not a good thing. So one of the other things I celebrate about this new era of identification and management of severe asthma is the recognition we can't just keep piling on steroids, have an inadequate result without recognizing there is some cost to some individuals for those steroids. And I don't know if John and Jane Q public are really aware of that we need to be vigilant about the steroids that we're administering also. I don't think there's a public awareness of that yet, but I'd be interested to hear what my colleagues have to say to their patients ever say to them, oh, wait a second, you just doubled my fluticasone dose from 50 to 100 or 120. Is that really something? Or do people again just blithely walk down the street and whatever you say as a clinician, they'll go ahead and do. I, but I would need your input to understand that better. Please go ahead, Dr. Jane. Yes, so my experience has been that there is a significant group of patients who are uh, quite uh, reasonably very apprehensive about the frequent steroid use. But the group of patients who um, are invariably severe asthma, they invariably are keen user of steroid and they are first to seek steroid prescriptions because in their own personal experiences, that is the only medication that has helped them feel better, get better. And so far, I mean, we had the limitations of not having availability of a good alternative. And luckily with so many biologics now, we would have those options to offer them. But in the past, it was not the case. And patients invariably would say, that is the only thing that works for me. And I would like that prescription. Thank you. You know, I think really helping them understand the difference between an inhaled corticosteroid versus a systemic steroid is really important. And so I spend quite a bit of time trying to ex uh, um, explain that to them and help them understand when they use their inhaler and it's just going right to their lungs, 
if they have the proper inhaler technique, but if they're using a lot of oral cortic or a lot of oral steroids over the year, um, there was one study I found a while back and it showed how many days that you could use Advair versus one dose of prednisone. And I think it was 100, over 100,000 days or something like that. And so getting them to understand that one, you may have a lot of empty canisters, but it's a tiny, tiny little amount. And it's just going right to the lungs. Whereas if you're using steroids, it's going through your heart and your liver, your kidneys, your blood. Plus it impairs your immune system, which is not what we want during a, a pandemic. So really getting them to understand the different types of medication, um, I think really seems to help them. I completely agree. And I also think tagging for those patients that are very prednisone responsive and get that, um, achieve that really um, great control. And they feel from a respiratory standpoint that prednisone makes their respiratory symptoms melt away. I try to tag that to say, that's what we want to achieve. And now we want to get to that point with a different route, because we know that the systemic steroids, the prednisone pills have so many adverse effects that we want to achieve that benefit and sustain it, but, but pick a different way to get there. And then we're going to use the best you've felt, whether it's after prednisone or, or other conditions and try to get, that's our goal. Um, and we're gonna march towards that goal in a, in a different way. Um, that if somebody is a candidate for biologics and, and you have someone who's prednisone dependent, then that's I think a very sort of classic case that you're going to try to use the biologic to substitute for the prednisone. But for patients that aren't quite there, I use that as a way to talk about inhaled corticosteroids and bring up all of those points that Andrea just mentioned, how just a short, a couple of days of prednisone is worth a whole year of an inhaled steroid that's used um, very consistently. It's still a challenge to get people to use their inhaled steroid, inhaled corticosteroids consistently, but I think at least giving, trying to dispel the concerns about the relative benefit or the relative harms of inhaled steroids, you know, is really necessary as a foundation. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, I just want to read some of what we have going on in the chat. Like I said, I'll be reading some of these things for our recorded folks who are watching this uh, from recording. Um, so Dr. McCormick actually asks, she'd also like to know about our audi um, how our audience feels about asking their patients about their inhalers um, and what you find in terms of inhaler use and adherence. Obviously a big, um, a big question there. And then uh, Dr. Sankar says, has a question actually, um, asymptomatic, asthmatic person with persistent wheeze, can we classify him as severe asthma? Do you want, do you want um, Dr. I think Sankar I could to try expand? To start to, uh, sure, actually, if you would like to expand, I would love to hear a little bit more detail about the patient you have in mind. Yeah, and feel free to come off mute and let us know if you can. Hi, hello. Hello. Hello, hi. Uh, I am Dr. Bhim Shankar. I am a consultant pulmonologist from Andhra Pradesh, India. Like, uh, uh, I practice in a rural setup. So we have many patients who are like uh, most of day to day exposed to a number of uh, uh, environmental dust and all. So they will be like some of the asthmatic patients, they will be regularly using the treatment and they are almost asymptomatic. They, they will be carrying their day-to-day -day life continuously without any difficulty. But on our clinical examination, we will have persistent weeds. So uh, they may not be qualifying under bronchiectasis and all, but they will be having just persistent weeds. So uh, can we consider them as uh, severe asthma? That's a, that's a, sounds like to me a tricky question. Um, and I guess I would, a couple things that come to mind um, are whether when you're, uh, in terms of your pulmonary exam, one thing that can manifest as wheeze would be an upper airway sound. So if a patient is um, kind of creating a sound from their upper airway um, that uh, is being transmitted into the room, 
And that can be difficult to discern, but um, if you had someone you really thought either didn't have asthma or had very well controlled asthma, but then you had kind of an inconsistent finding on physical exam, that would be one thing I would wonder about. But with, a, with uh, something that, let's say, say this is a lower respiratory wheezing sound that you are appreciating on physical exam, um, I would think that that would be something to take seriously and would be consistent with asthma or airflow obstruction. Um, ideally, if you had spirometry, I think that would be a helpful piece of information. If you have absolutely no symptoms, but you do have a physical exam finding, it would be nice if you had the ability to have either a peak flow to see if whether there's variability or spirometry to add a little bit more objective data. Um, and then I guess a final comment might be to um, maybe revisit symptoms, just to think about symptoms, for example, of cough and make sure sometimes people think that um, coughing isn't asthma, where cough is a, is a common manifestation of asthma. Uh, maybe waking in the middle of the night and making sure that someone's not waking in the middle of the night and attributing it to sort of poor, poor sleep, but maybe it has to do with um, their breathing. And then thinking about exertion and whether um, physical, sometimes people will make changes and we see this in COPD as well, where they'll modify their activity in response to their symptoms. And maybe this happens over time without it being um, so in the forefront of their consciousness, but they're making subtle ad adaptations. So I think um, that sounds like it can be a challenge. Sometimes it's challenging to to make the diagnosis. And then of course, thinking about alternative um, diagnoses as well. Um, and I think we captured many of those in the, in the video lecture. And I yes. welcome my comments uh, my colleagues. Clinically, uh, clinically, can this, uh, like from what you have explained, clinically, can this be uh, fit into ACOS group? I'm sorry, can you repeat that one more time? Uh, from what we what you have explained, uh, from this clinical point of view, can we fit this type of patient into ACOS group? Like, uh, like re from uh, only clinical point of view, not uh, from uh, this uh, uh, other uh, objective measures. Only from clinical point of view, can we like think of ACOS in in such situations? So asthma COPD overlap? Yes. Uh, so I think then um, some key features would be whether there's an exposure like tobacco smoke or indoor air pollution or other exposures that may increase the likelihood of COPD. And then um, age would be, I think if it was someone in their young 20s or even early 30s, COPD would be less likely. Um, and then the spirometry I think would then be more, even more helpful um, to look at whether uh, the severity of airflow obstruction, and then if you had imaging to see whether there's a presence of emphysema, that would also be helpful. And then we didn't really talk about allergic features in your patient, but that would be another um, uh, feature that would be helpful to characterize a bit more. Um, one, just the drivers of, of their symptoms, as well as if you had, classically, if you had a strong allergic profile and it started in childhood and you had smoking and evidence of the CO, of emphysema on a CT scan or a chest x-ray, then obviously like, you know, that would give you much more confidence that you have asthma COPD overlap. But as in your patient, many people don't have sort of the most classic presentation. I'd like to give a little input about that also, but I, I may need your help, Dr. McCormick, because I would have thought that just like in resistant hypertension, even if a patient is controlled, if they're taken for drugs, they're resistant. So if Dr. Jane's patient, even if they are asymptomatic completely, if they're at GINA5, don't they still fulfill the criteria for severe? Because I thought that his question was, should I, be, should I be knocking on the door of exploring severe asthma when my patient appears to be essentially asymptomatic except for my Ascultatory wheeze, and I would say yes, because what you can then do is you can offer your patient choices. So even though she may feel like her control is satisfactory, you may also have to dig further, as Dr. McCormick has suggested, to say, is my patient prematurely satisfied? Are they 
stopping playing tennis because they get a little short of breath and they didn't put that into their equation. But even if they are perfectly satisfied, you give them options once you identify them as severe asthma to say, do we wish to use either add or, or is substitute what your therapy is now by considering a biologic because you do qualify for consideration of that. So that's how I would st stack it up. I think you are wise to not fall prey to being falsely comfortable with a person who's taking level five medicine, assuming everything's fine, when it's possible you could put them into total remission or at least much better control by going down the exploration of the possibility of severe asthma. You know, I think the other thing to look at is uh, those of us with asthma are notorious compensators. Um, we learn to compensate over the years. And so oftentimes when I'm working with someone that's been referred to me and I'll ask them how they're doing, oh, I'm fine. My asthma is really fine. I don't think I need your help. And my doctor wants me to talk to you. So when I do their asthma control test, it'll be a seven. And as most of you know, you need to be 20 or above to be well controlled. And so um, it comes as a little bit of a shock to them. And then I'll explain to them that if, if it's not controlled all those years and they have that inflammation in their lungs that they get that lung scarring. And, and I don't know if this is something that uh, the age of your, of your patient, um, the one that we're discussing, but you know, is this something that their asthma has not been treated all their life? And so now they've progressed into um, ACOS because they have all that airway remodeling. But I think that that's the biggest thing is to get people to understand here's the level where you need to be. You need to be 20 or above. And then when we ask them all those questions, they, they just have no idea that they're not well controlled. They think they're okay because they've learned to compensate over the years. There's one other thing I think deserves focus in our discussion today since we're at the beginning. Sometimes we overlook simple but critical steps I was shocked to read a study in the diabetes literature that looked at experienced insulin administrators who felt completely comfortable that they were administering their insulin appropriately, and yet the majority were making one or more errors in insulin utilization, either in allowing the drug to come to room temperature or the site of application or time of day, a, a whole variety of errors. And it, embarrassingly enough, the literature on primary care clinicians shows that when we go to instruct the patient on how to use the inhaler, that we make errors, that it's the rarity that a primary care clinician knows all nine or 10 appropriate steps. And yet we're the ones who are responsible for teaching the patient how to do it. Why would we be surprised that there may be gaps in how they do it? And then one last thing, it's never too late for re-education. I'm 75 years old this year, and there isn't a day that goes by that I don't realize I wish I were smarter, or I need to relearn something, or I forgot something. So when residents come to me, like in, for, in the field of diabetes, I don't think there's the equivalent in asthma. If there does, I, I'd love to know about it. In diabetes, Medicare will pay for a person to get multiple visits to a diabetes educator. And when a resident comes to me and says, oh yeah, well, the person got their diabetes education five years ago, so they're done. I say, no, no, education about your health is lifelong learning. Don't assume that just because the day you wrote the prescription for the inhaler, you showed the patient the steps, that they're gonna retain that for the rest of their life. Please tell me, young doctor, what was the lecture you went to, heard some important facts and remembered all of them for the rest of your life. So re-education is important for all of us, and I don't feel the least bit limitation to my humility to say to a patient who I've known really well, I know we told you about this before, but it's been a couple of years since we've talked about it. Let's talk about it again, because we can all use a refresher on most of the issues in our life where knowledge can be critical. Sorry, one more thing quickly. And, and yes, Dr. K, absolutely. And I think people will often say to me, well, I've had asthma all my life. I could teach you a thing or two, honey. But what they don't realize is asthma is constantly changing. Medications are changing. Guidelines are changing. And so something I posted just recently is how far asthma medications have come in the U.S. in just seven years. So um, this was seven years ago, Allergy and Asthma Network, the medications that were available. And this is what we have today. So I don't know if you can see from clear back here, you can see, that's kind of hard to see. I'll try to get in the camera. But um, you know that, that's easily double, double the medications that we used to have. So I think people don't realize the world is always revolving, asthma is always revolving, and it's important to stay up on the latest update.
Thank you so much, Andrea. And I know, Andrea, you and I have talked about this before, but I think that that tool you just showed to me is my most trusted, most beneficial tool that I have. And that's how I start each of my visits with um, my new patients, as well as with patients I've seen for years. And they, the ones I've seen for years know that's how we're going to start. And I just slide that across the desk and I ask them what medicines they're taking. And when they point to them, I say, how do you take it? And if they look at me blankly, I say, once a day, twice a day, in the morning, at night. And then when they say in the morning, I say one puff or two puffs. And then I talk, ask them, you know, like how much of the time do you think you miss a dose? And I make sure to say, you know, a lot of, most people miss doses. Um, and then try to, trying to be really open-ended and let them drive that conversation to, um, to really get a sense of what's going on. And those pictures are invaluable. And, and I find them a big time saver as well. Thank you so much. Um, we have some wonderful conversation happening in the chat. Um, Marsha Miller absolutely agrees with teaching the correct way to use an inhaler, um, has them return to the office to demonstrate um, and does this with inhalers and nasal sprays. Um, also loves that display and uses it in primary care. Um, we do have one more question, and I'd like to say, you know, thanks to Dr. Sankar's uh, question, we kind of got into a bit of a patient case it wasn't quite a presentation, but it was a more clinical um, based conversation. So, and because we're running a little bit low on time, we don't really have time to go through our formal case presentation by Dr. McCormick. Um, so, but I think next week we can potentially open that back up uh, because we have such a, an, an interactive and big group here today. Uh, but I do want to mention, um, Samia, we see your question here. She said, could you kindly express the misuse of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and asthma exacerbation? I feel like we touched on this, but maybe we can get into it a little further. And then also uh, stress and how it impacts severe asthma. Starting with the stress piece, um, I will say that uh, I think stress is a huge trigger for asthma, and it's probably one of the least well recognized. Um, and I find this uh, at different life stages as well. And depending on my patient's life stage, I might ask them about different stressors. And I think sometimes patients are trying to tell us in different ways, um, just in conversation as, as we're starting a visit. And so one of the things that I like to do is really to directly identify that. And so if someone's telling me that you know, they have a adult child that's moved back in the house or, um, you know, the, they're getting a divorce or um, their kids are going off to college and they're feeling worried about that, all different types of things. Um, I try to just identify that and say, we know that stress is a trigger for asthma. And so, um, you know, if, if this is causing changes, this is something that, you know, we should think about together. And if we need to think about other resources, to try to manage that stress. That's something that, just to let them know that that fits into the context of this visit and that it's something that I wanna know about. Um, and I think I've, uh, you know, over time have recognized that there are some profound examples where people's asthma has really changed in response to resolution of stress as well as um, onset of stress. So it's a great question. I wanna let my colleagues comment as well. I'm so glad you brought up the issue of stress because in the primary care setting, if patients often think if the doctor didn't ask about it, it must not be important. And so we, in essence, often orchestrate the visit. When the patient comes in and it says they're there for a blood pressure recheck, it's so easy to overlook asking them things about how's your bowel function or your bladder function or your relationship within your network or your anxiety or depression. And so if it is left unaddressed, People walk away thinking, well, it must not be that important. Nobody's ever inquired about it. I think you will find that people feel validated when someone is really ready to respect the fact life is hard and complicated for everyone at some time or other, and for many people, much, if not all of the time. So I think that be give, given the opportunity to open that door and say, I really want to know who you are beyond your, quote, disease, makes the patient feel more like a person in your eyes and that you're willing to consider the totality of who they are other than just the lung of who they are. Thank you. And I just want to um, mention what Andrea wrote in the chat. Um, 
that she teaches um, patients how to belly breathe for stress. Um, and also, of course, addresses any other areas like are they food insecure? Do they need help with rent? Um, if they can't control other areas of their life, we know their asthma will not be addressed. Thank you, everyone. Alrighty, well, we are getting close to the 3 p.m. Eastern hour. Um, I do want to um, ask if anyone has a patient that they would like to discuss with us next week, um, Dr. Sankar, or uh, let's see if, if he's, is Dr. Jane still with us? He might've sc scooted down on my list. Would anyone, would anyone like to present um, or just you know, talk about their patient next week? Ashley, uh, Rebecca Kellen has one, but she sent the message to me instead oh, okay. of putting it out to everyone. Oh, thank you so much, Rebecca. Excellent. All right, can we get? Do we all remember the echo clap from uh, from last week? Can we get an echo clap? Ah, <laughs> excellent. Thank you. Oh, and and Dr. Sankar will share his case as well. Excellent. Thank you all so much. This is great. We will certainly we will have cases for two weeks in a row. I am thrilled to hear that. Uh, and then we can kind of look into it and get into a little bit more depth about um, treatment for those patients. So thank you both very much. We'll be in touch about those. Uh, thank you, uh, Tabitha. Uh, so. Before we finish up, we of course have our post-test polling questions. So let me open these up. Question one, all asthma that is difficult to control is considered to be severe asthma, true or false? Question two, which of the following represents a patient with severe asthma? A 28-year-old woman with childhood asthma on ICS, normal FEV1, no wheeze, cough, or dyspnea, a 32-year-old man with adult onset asthma, seasonal allergies. He's on an antihistamine, a nasal steroid with wheezing and cough spells, spells multiple times per week. Or a 48-year-old woman, a cat owner with childhood onset asthma on ICS, LABA, an LT modifier with wheezing and cough one to two times per week. And question three, severe asthma accounts for approximately what proportion of all asthma? Five to 10%, 15 to 20%, 25 to 30 or 35 to 40. Alrighty, I'm gonna end this and then share it. So Dr. McCormick, how did we do? Great, so um, the audience got 92% correct for all asthma that is difficult to control is considered to be severe because we know that someone could have mild but poorly controlled asthma. So great job. Uh, which of the following is a patient with severe asthma? And the last patient, the 48-year-old female who has uh, childhood onset asthma is on uh, an inhaled corticosteroid, a long-acting beta agonist, a leukotriene modifier, and is still having symptoms uh, frequently, has severe asthma that is also poorly controlled. And it's severe because they're still having those symptoms, but they're on those... Um, they're on that step uh, on step four to five. So they're on the, uh, other inhaled medications where our other patients are just on ICS for the first patient and are on nasal treatment on the second patient. And then finally, severe uh, asthma accounts for five to 10% of all asthma. And the majority of uh, the group got that. So great job, everyone. Excellent work. Thank you all so much for answering those. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, and thank you to everyone who volunteered for next week. We'll be in touch and we will get the patient case form out to you. Um, this was a great session. Thanks everyone for joining us. We cannot wait to see you all next week. Echo clap. Have a good one. Bye-bye everybody.